music, and by the preaching of the Word. And I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to the first book in the New Testament, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. I'm preaching tonight on this subject, a glimpse of His glory. A glimpse of His glory. From the book of Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. Would you please stand with your Bibles open in honor and reverence for the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain privately, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine like the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were very much afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. Let us pray. Dear God, I ask tonight for what I do not deserve. I ask tonight for what I cannot borrow. I ask tonight, God, for what I cannot buy. I ask tonight, God, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I might preach as a dying man to a dying world. God, give me a divine touch. Put your words in my mouth, your thoughts in my mind. Lord Jesus, I must decrease, and you must increase. And I confess that the devil is a defeated foe, that he was disarmed at the cross, that Jesus Christ is in charge. And I'm praying tonight, Holy Spirit, that you'll fill this place and manifest among us the tangible felt presence of Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, Lord. Amen. And you may be seated. We are familiar with the great events in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate them, we preach, and we teach them. For instance, we're familiar with the truth of His birth, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. We're familiar and we treasure the truth of His crucifixion, that Jesus Christ died in our place in agony and shame on an old rugged cross. We're familiar, we celebrate the fact of His resurrection, that after three days and three nights in a borrowed tomb, the Bible says the Holy Spirit visited that dark tomb and raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We're also familiar with His ascension. The Bible says after He walked for a few days upon this earth, Gravity lost its hold upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord Jesus Christ began to ascend up into heaven. And we're also familiar with that great event that is yet to come, promised at His ascension, when the angel said to those disciples watching Him ascend, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen Him go. So we're very familiar with the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the promised second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here in the book of Matthew chapter 17, we're confronted with one of the great events in the life of Jesus that many times we overlook. It is what we call the transfiguration. The Bible teaches us on a high mountain, our Lord was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. The Bible says His face did shine like the sun and His raiment was as white as the light. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, He disguised or clothed His deity and His majesty in a body of flesh and bones. And when people looked at the Lord Jesus Christ, He looked like the carpenter from the city of Nazareth. But just for a moment... The Lord Jesus Christ peels back His flesh, peels back His humanity, and allows these men to see His blazing, majestic glory. Now this great event in the life of Jesus that we call the transfiguration has many practical lessons for the life 
of a Christian. For instance, it teaches us something about the appetite of a Christian. The Bible says in verse 1 that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on that mountain with Him. When I got saved, when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, when I was born again, God gave me a new set of appetites. The Bible speaks of our spiritual appetites. The Bible says in the epistles of Paul that we are to desire the milk of the Word as babes, but when we become strong in the faith, then we hunger for the meat of the Word. So there's the milk of the Word, and there's the meat of the Word. I have a spiritual appetite to desire the things of God. The Bible teaches us that that's important, that we are to develop that appetite because not every believer has the same intensity of appetite. Some people want more. Some people hunger for a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now at first glance, when we see that he took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, we say, was he showing favoritism? Did he like these three better than the others? Was that why Jesus took them there? I don't think so. Now let me tell you this, I can understand why he didn't take Judas Iscariot, because Judas Iscariot had never been saved, and the Lord knew he was of the devil. But he takes these three. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ take Peter, James, and John to the top of that mountain and yet he left the other nine below? He did this more than once. The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 8 that our Lord Jesus Christ was confronted by the ruler of the synagogue named Jairus. And Jairus said, I've got a 12-year-old daughter at home and she's dying. Would you come? And Jesus Christ was on his way to heal that little girl but he was confronted by another need and he took the time to perform another miracle. And by the time he got to Jairus' house, they said, the little girl is dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ was going to go into that room. He was going to face this dead girl. He was getting ready to perform a tremendous miracle. But he didn't let everybody go into the room. He took Peter, he took James, he took John, he took the mama, he took the daddy, and in that moment, in that room, he raised that little girl from the dead. That's strange. Isn't it? He took Peter, James, and John and left the other disciples outside. When our Lord Jesus Christ went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says when He got to the garden, He left nine of the disciples behind, and He said, I want you, Peter, James, and John, to go with me into the interior of this garden, where our Lord prayed, as it were, great sweat drops of blood, and said, Lord, not my will, but Thy will be done. That was a holy place. That was a place of our Lord's passion when He said, I'll drink the cup of your wrath against the sins of the world. But He only took Peter, James, and John. And here in the book of Matthew chapter 17, our Lord Jesus Christ goes up to this mountain, peels back His flesh, and exposes His glory. But only Peter, James, and John are there. It's not because they're perfect men, and it's not because of their height, and it's not because of their looks. I believe the Lord saw in these three men a deeper appetite, a deeper hunger. You see, some folks just want more of what Jesus has to offer. Some folks expect more of what Jesus has to offer. When I stand and preach in the church that I've pastored now for nearly 19 years, I'm fully aware that there are some folks that just come out of routine Sunday after Sunday. They just come to church because they've been coming to church for years. And I get up there and pour out my soul, and they just sit there, and it's water off a duck's bag. They have learned to sleep with their eyes open. They have hypnotized themselves. They go to their happy place. They're in la-la land. And as soon as it's over, they leave unchanged. But there are those in that service that have a lift in their step and a twinkle in their eye and something in their countenance that reminds me that in the body of Christ there is a remnant who says, I'll not be satisfied with the religious routine. I'm not going to sit in a rut. I'm not satisfied to sit on a pew. I don't want business as usual. I want God to do something in my life so miraculous that I know it's God. I hunger for the supernatural. I want a touch from God. Let me tell you this. If you don't want anything when you go to church, you won't get anything when you go to church. But if you want something when you go to church, you'll get something when you go to church. When you go to the 
Word, if you don't want anything and you don't expect anything, you're not going to get anything. But if you go to the Word of God and you expect God to speak to you, God's going to speak to you. So I'm saying that this teaches me that I have a holy, majestic God who has an arm full of blessings and He's waiting for a believer who has the spiritual hunger and passion to say, Lord, I want all of your blessings. I'm going to claim all of your promises. And God, I'm not going to be satisfied with the thimble full of your glory. I want the whole load. Because the Bible says, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will be filled. But the Bible not only teaches us something here about the appetite of a Christian, the Bible teaches us something here about the transformation of a Christian. This scripture helps me understand the process of sanctification in the life of a believer. Sanctification is the second tense of salvation. When we put our faith in Christ, we are justified, declared righteous by God. We are saved from the penalty of sin. And then in the future someday, we'll be glorified. We'll be taken out of this world, given a resurrection body. We'll be saved from the very presence of sin. But now in this life as a believer, I'm in that second tense of salvation. The Bible calls that to be sanctified. It's also a word that means to be holy, and it is a process. Sanctification means to be set apart from sin for the exclusive use of God. Sanctification is that ongoing step-by-step process whereby the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and is fashioning my character into the very likeness of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice the Bible says in verse 2, and he was transfigured before them. Now, the word transfigured there is a very interesting word. In our English language, it's our word metamorphosis. It's a change on the outside that comes from within. The old caterpillar, he constructs that cocoon around him. It's ugly to look at, but suddenly there's a crack in it. It begins to open up and suddenly a butterfly emerges. There's a change on the outside that comes from within. That's the process of metamorphosis. Holiness does not begin on the outside and then work to the inside. True holiness begins on the inside and works to the outside. When our Lord was transfigured, the majesty and the glory of His deity was revealed. That's the way He's going to look the next time He comes. The next time He comes, He's not going to look like the peasant carpenter from Galilee. He is going to come with the radiant majesty and the glory of the, of the heavens. He is going to glow. He is going to radiate the presence of God. Does the Bible Bible not say in 1 John 1 5 that God is light? And does the Bible not say in Hebrews 1 3 that Jesus is the brightness of his glory? And you say, Well, preacher, what does this have to do with my sanctification? Me becoming more like Christ? Well, we find this word transfigured again in the Bible relating specifically to the life of a Christian in the book of Romans, chapter 12. I just want to read this to you real quick. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 in verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now what does it mean to present your body a living sacrifice? That means absolute surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Not holding anything back. I'm laying everything in His hands. I'm letting go. I'm surrendering totally to His control. The Bible says, I surrender, I present my body, I I surrender my all as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And then notice what it says in verse 2 of Romans 12. And be not conformed. And the word conform means to be pressed into the mold. Be not conformed to the world. Do not be pressed into the mold of the world. But here it is, but be ye transformed. Now the word transformed there is the very same word that is translated transfigured over in the book of Matthew chapter 17. 
It means a change on the outside that comes from within. So the Bible says, when I as a believer surrender my all to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, when I present my body a living sacrifice, I am renewed and I am fashioned and changed and I'm not in the likeness of the world, but I become more in the likeness of Jesus. It's surrender. But you know what? It's used again, that same word, in the life of a believer. And it's found over in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And the Bible says this. Now remember, we're talking about our sanctification. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror. And remember, James 1 says, A mirror is the Word of God. So we're beholding as in the Word, the glory of the Lord, His majesty, His radiance. It says, when we behold the glory of the Lord in the Word, we are changed. The word change there is the same word in the Greek New Testament that is translated transfigured in the book of Matthew chapter 17. It is a change on the outside that comes from within. Listen to what it says. We are changed. We are transformed from glory to glory. I never arrive in my Christian life. I'm moving higher. I'm going deeper. I'm not what I used to be. And I'm not what I'm going to be. So what does that verse mean? It means, now listen, when I look into the Word of God, I see the Son of God and the Spirit of God transforms me into the glory of God. It means that when I peer into the Scriptures and I focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Spirit of God takes my character like a lump of clay and He molds my character into the very likeness of Jesus Christ. So the Bible teaches us something there about the transformation of a Christian. But it gets better. The Bible teaches us in this great event in the life of Jesus Christ, it teaches us something about the death of a Christian. Now, some folks think more about death than others. And the older you get, the more you think about death. The more you realize your own mortality. As a pastor who does funerals on a regular basis, I I think about death a lot. I go to the cemetery. I speak to the people at the funeral. You know, some of you are here tonight, you've been thinking about death because you've got a loved one that's gone on before you. You've got a child, and you've wondered what's that all about because a child should bury their parents. A parent shouldn't bury their child. And some of you have got a mom or a dad that's gone on into eternity, and you wonder about that. You wonder, preacher, what's going to happen to us after we die? Now, there's some who believe that this is all there is and there is nothing beyond the grave. They don't believe in the immortality of the soul. And then there are a lot of cults and different religions that teach all kinds of weird things. For instance, there's one group that teaches that when a believer dies, our soul will sleep in the grave into the resurrection. That means your grandma's soul's in the grave. That means your brother's soul's in the grave. They're all sleeping out there in that cemetery until the resurrection. And then there's some that teach the doctrine of purgatory, kind of a halfway house. When you die, you go to a holding tank. And if your folks can get enough folks to light candles and pay enough money to the clergyman, maybe they can pray you out of it. There are all these weird ideas about death. But my friend, the Bible reveals to me about the death of a Christian. I don't have to wonder about the death of a Christian. Did you notice who's talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? The Bible says in verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto him two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Moses and Elijah had been gone a long time. They left the earth hundreds of years before they talked to Jesus Christ. So that tells me the dead aren't dead. That tells me the dead don't cease to be. That tells me the dead who are dead in Christ just depart. This tells me that to be absent from my body is to be present with the Lord. You don't sleep in the grave. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you'll be with me in paradise. This teaches me there's a heaven. 
Because they came to this place from some place. If they hadn't been some place, they couldn't come to this place. And I'm telling you, heaven is a place. And when you die, you don't go to the grave and you don't sleep in the grave. But you immediately are transferred into the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Herb, well, I know my family in heaven. Well, of course, the Bible says one's named Moses here and the other's name Elijah. I don't lose my identity in heaven. I'm going to keep my name in heaven. And even my soul must have some form and recognition that these men recognize that's Moses and these men recognize that's Elijah. So Christians don't sleep in a grave. They don't go to a place that's called purgatory. They go to a place that's called heaven. And let me tell you, what I believe about heaven I believe it is called the Father's house because it is a place of belonging we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever I believe it's got a street of gold not streets of gold because there's no bad side of town in heaven I believe heaven is a place where there's no arthritis it's a place where there's no bursitis it's a place where there's no gingivitis it's a place where there are no committee meetings it's a place where there's nobody cantankerous and there's nobody angry and there's nobody sad and there's nobody mad and we're never going to hurt and hallelujah there's no dialysis there's no chemotherapy there's no sugar diabetes and the sun never sets and we never grow old and we get to hug the neck of Jesus Christ for all of eternity but let me tell you what if you're going to heaven you want to go to heaven there's only one way Now notice they're having a conversation with Jesus. The Bible says in verse 3, they were talking with Him. And you know, Baptist people, they they like to eavesdrop. You know, they always wonder what they're talking about. See those guys talking over there? I saw them talking down the front porch. What are they talking about? I know what these two were talking to Jesus about. It's revealed over in the book of Luke chapter 9 in verse 31. They were talking to Him about His death, about His departure about his trip up to Jerusalem. Now why would they be talking to Jesus Christ about his death, about the cross? Because all those Old Testament saints are in heaven on credit up to this point. They've been looking to the Jesus who is to come, to the Messiah who is to come, to the cross who is to come. And so they're encouraging Him on the journey. Go all the way, Jesus. Thank You for going to the cross to save our souls. Let me explain something to you, my friend. The only way you'll ever go to heaven is not through a baptistry, it's not through a confirmation class, and it's not by praying five times to Mecca. The only way you'll ever go to heaven is to be washed in the blood, come to an old rugged cross, and be born born again with the power of the Spirit of the living God. And the Bible teaches us something about the death of a Christian, appetite of a Christian, transformation of a Christian. The Bible also has something to teach us about the ruler of a Christian. And this is the real crisis in the life of believers in the church today. Who's going to be your boss? Who's going to rule you? Well, I know who shouldn't rule you. Experiences shouldn't rule you. Verse 4 says, Then Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be up here. Man, this is great. Now let's just stay up here on this mountain. Man, I'm loving the goosebumps, the inspiration, the bright lights, the miracles, signs and wonders. Let's make three tabernacles. One for Moses, and one for Elijah, and one for you, and we'll just live up here. We'll just stay up here. And folks, God never meant us to live on the mountain. We just visit the mountain. And I need to visit the mountain every once in a while. Now I know emotion is something that can get you in trouble, but every once in a while i got to have a little emotion. I mean, I need a little inspiration. And I just feel like everybody can get excited about football. A bunch of guys pushing an oblong ball up down a cow pasture. If got, like I got on the airplane in Jacksonville, Florida, and all the NASCAR folks are going home. They all got their leather jackets on, man. They spent all day Sunday watching those cars going around in circles, sniffing the fumes. I feel like if they can get enthused about that, I can get enthused about the fact that my Lord Jesus Christ died for me, shed His blood for me, that He's coming for me, that He will never leave me and never forsake me. I believe it's okay for me to be excited about that. And let me tell you something, child of God, when you're fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil, when you're out there seeking to live a life that honors God, it gets tiresome and it gets weary. 
And sometimes you feel alone. And every once in a while, I need to get under the spout where the glory comes out so I can get a little more unction in my gumption to keep on functioning for the Lord Jesus Christ. No, they weren't supposed to stay on this mountain. They were up on that mountain to get a glimpse of His glory, to fill up their tanks, because at the bottom of that mountain was a demon-possessed boy that needed deliverance. Life is not lived on the mountain. It's lived down there in that demon-possessed valley below. So friend, don't tell me about how you looked out the back window and saw Jesus in a terry cloth bathrobe riding a John Deere tractor and now that makes you more spiritual than the rest of us. I'm telling you, our life is not to be ruled by blessings but by the blesser, not by miracles but by the miracle worker, the Lord Jesus. Tell you something else, people should not rule us. America's crazy about celebrities. You know, I mean just nuts about it. And notice they say, listen, we, we want to build three tabernacles in verse 4. We're going to have one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. In other words, we're going to put all you guys on the same level. Well, now they had some things in common. I mean, they had great experiences on mountains. Moses got the Ten Commandments on a mountain. Elijah saw the fire fall on a mountain. And Jesus is going to die on a cross on a mountain. And they all exited the world in unusual ways. Moses died and God buried him with his own hands. Elijah just got in a chariot and went on to heaven. And Jesus came out of a grave, resurrected miraculously. But let me tell you something. One of these three is above the other two. Let me tell you. Jesus is not on the same level with Moses and He's not on the same level with Elijah. He's above Moses. He's above Elijah. And Simon Peter needed to understand that. Don't be enamored with men. Don't be enamored with celebrities. And church, let's don't fall to that mentality and create Christian celebrities. There's only one star. There's only one celebrity. And His name is Jesus Christ. Tell you what, don't, don't, don't be ruled by your failures. Don't let your failures rule you. God is a God of another chance. Look, Peter, he just can't keep his mouth shut. He already got in trouble in the previous chapter and tried to get Jesus not to go to the cross. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, the devil's using you. He can't keep his mouth shut. And I do the same thing. I'm one of these folks that if you're sitting with folks and the conversation stops and there's a lull, and there's silence and it gets awkward, I feel like i got to fill the void. And that's when I get in trouble. It's when I'm trying to fill that void with just something off the top of my head. Notice what happens here. The Bible says in verse 5, while he was running his mouth. That's what it says. While he yet spoke... The glory of God covered him up, and this is what God said. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. In other words, if you would hush up, and if you would listen up, my Son could say something here that could help you. You know what I found in my life? The moments in my life when I failed have been the times when God has taught me my greatest lessons. So don't let the devil chain you to past failures, but understand that Jesus doesn't throw away broken things. He just remakes you and molds you and makes you stronger. Uh, to don't be ruled by your fears. Notice when that cloud came down on them, the Bible says in verse 6, the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were very much afraid. And we're living in a nation that's nearly paralyzed by fear. What's going to happen to Medicare? What's going to happen to Social Security? What's going to happen to the Supreme Court? What's going to happen to Congress? Who's going to run for president the next time? What's going to happen to the stock exchange? What's going to happen about terrorism? Should my baby wear these clothes because they said the other day on Oprah kids wearing these pajamas sometimes got some weird sickness because of the dye in them. I shouldn't eat that sweetener because it makes me lose my memory. I can't use that sugar because it will give me sugar diabetes. And I can't use that sweetener because it will give me cancer. So we're just around having a nervous breakdown. Under our circumstances, acting like God is dead. But notice what happens. 
These men, very much afraid, are touched by the Master's strong hand. The Bible says in verse 7, And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Jesus Christ says to the church of this 21st century, Don't be afraid. Don't worry about all of this other stuff because Jesus Christ has got it all mapped out and I'm telling you exactly what's going to happen. I don't know who's going to win the presidency. I don't know who's going to get elected to Congress. I don't know what's going to happen to the makeup of the Supreme Court. God only knows what's going to happen to the stock market. I don't know where interest rates are coming, but I do know this. One of these days, King Jesus is going to rapture out His church. There's going to be seven years of tribulation at the end of the tribulation he's going to saddle up in all of his transfigured majesty on a stallion he is going to land on the Mount of Olives his foot is going to touch it it's going to split half in two he is going to walk across the Kedron Valley kick open the eastern gate ascend the temple mount sit on the throne of David and every knee shall bow and say he's the boss he's the king and he's the ruler The Bible says in verse 8 when they lifted up their eyes and this is where this whole story brings us when they lifted up their eyes they saw Jesus only. And I believe when we look at these scriptures that's what we need to understand. He's not just a man. He's God. He's not on the level of anybody else. He's God. He died on the cross and He shed His blood not so that He could be in the back seat but that He could be in the driver's seat. And the issue tonight as we draw this service to a close is Jesus Christ the absolute sovereign ruler of your life. I love Alan Redpath. When I was a student at Moody Bible Institute many years ago, Dr. Redpath, great preacher, who at one time pastor of Moody Church came and spoke in chapel. And I got his books Awesome pastor. For many years he carried on a great conference ministry and he traveled all over. He had two little bitty girls when he first started that conference ministry. And every time he came back from a trip, he bought them a gift. He brought them a gift and they couldn't wait for him to get home to greet him and get their gift. Well, one time he got home real late from a trip and he went to bed. He got up early and he hadn't seen the little girls the night before. And the next morning he was sitting in his study and he heard the little pitter-patter of the feet of one of his daughters. And uh, it was the older of the two, and, and she came in and she saw him, and she rushed and she wrapped her arms around his legs and held him tight. And then he heard a second set of foot pitter-pattering down, feet down the, the hallway. And it was the younger of the two. And when she came in and saw that other daughter already there, she just began to weep because she wanted to be the first one to welcome him home. And kids being kids, the older daughter looked back at the younger and said, I have all of daddy that there is. She just weeping. Dr. Redpath picked up that younger daughter that was crying and wrapped his arms around her and held her close to his heart. And she looked down at her older sister and she said, You may have all of daddy there is, but daddy's got all of me that there is. And that's the issue tonight. You've got all of Jesus that there is, but does Jesus have all of you? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And with our heads.